Go ahead and pause it. Or do you go ahead and pause it for a minute? Oh, okay. We're actually. All right. I want to thank everyone for coming. We actually are recording the uh, presentation, and maybe this will be a quick uh, introduction. So, Rajiv, and this will be kind of Q and A. When did we meet, and when were you at WIU? Twenty eighteen uh, is. 2018 August is when I came in WIU and I emailed you in, I think, June or July of 2018. Yep. And then we I did a thesis with me and yep. was dealing with caterpillars eating each other and some gene expression. Is that right? Yes. And specifically this same caterpillar. I was working on fall armyworm then as well. Okay. So I helped get you started and a path that was now what you're doing for your PhD project. I mean, something related, same caterpillar anyway. Yes. Uh, also, like, I still work with gene expression. So the qPCR knowledge that I learned in your lab has been very helpful. And you will see the results from qPCR here as well. Oh, wonderful. So, um, so you were a great student with me. You learned how to do qPCR. You became really critical for my lab in that time. And then we got hit with COVID, right? Yep. And Pretty so, much near the end of my last year. Yeah. The last few months was when the COVID had already started. So that was hard to work through. Pretty much remember being the only person in the building. And then, uh, so you were a wonderful student to have and and then you tried, you started off doing a PhD at Purdue and then you moved over to University of Tennessee. Yes. And there was an entomology department. And what can you say about entomology departments versus let's say biology departments? Is there any pros and cons before we get started? Um, or in the entomology department, the main advantage is more people are working in more related fields. So if someone is interested in just the entomology aspect, it's probably better to be in an entomology department compared to a biology department. But if someone is more interested in interdisciplinary work, biology department gives you the opening to see a lot more different works. So it's kind of a pro and con. Like for me, I think I am currently better suited being in an entomology department but at the same time, when I was starting, biology was where I should have been. And I am glad I was in biology rather than entomology because pure entomology departments, they don't do a whole lot of molecular work. Even in my department, I think our lab is the only one that does that. Whereas in a biology department, you have a lot more people who are working in molecular or related fields. Let me see if I can get the screen up for everybody. Um, should be able to switch screens, right? I think whatever's over here is what people see. So it's oh, like okay. already sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, is he sharing? Do we know? No. Yeah, he is. Um, Let's see if we can move it over. I think if you can just drag that. Is that like the, the setting? I don't know how to do that. Usually you see it. Um, I mean, we're just having a quick technical difficulty. Just pause it for a yeah, second. Yeah, so I'd say exit full screen. Okay. I'll just drag that thing over here. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. All right. So I think we're pretty much ready to go. Um, can everybody okay. see it at home by chance? Yep. Okay, great. All right, Rajiv. And so you're, we'll get you started. So you're, you're on your third year now at PhD program? Uh, no, fourth year, actually. Okay. And you're hoping to graduate this, this spring? Yes. Wonderful. All right, Rajiv, so go ahead and present your research. You had a recording, right? Yes, I am recording. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. 
welcome to my talk about mode of resistance to vip 3 a in two different Podoptera frugiparda strains. Uh, so let's introduce you to the insect that we in question. Spodoptera frugiparda, also known as fall armyworm, is a very significant pest of corn, cotton, rice, and about 300 other agricultural products. Um, this costs about a few billion dollars each year to control. And what is very important about this is it can destroy uh, fields um, yield by close to 90% if left unchecked. In 2016, this insect invaded Africa and multiple countries got hit so bad it caused like a famine-like situation in there. Um, it has evolved resistance to a variety of insecticides, so controlling it is not very easy. However, it is still susceptible to transgenic products that has cry or VIP3A protein, which we will talk about a little bit later. But since look at it, what the global impact of this insect has been, as you can see that its native range is in the Americas, both North and South America. In 2016, it was first discovered in Africa. Since then, 2018, it has spread throughout Asia, India, and then it has spread into Australia as well. It has even, even though it's not showing it here, but it has also spread in some parts of Europe as well. So you can understand why this is a huge deal. So the main ways of controlling it is through something called BT, BT product. So let's look at what that is. I will play a small video for like three or four minutes. Let me know if you guys can all hear it. Are you guys able to hear it? No, we're not able to hear it, Rajiv. Okay. Uh, let me see. What, what can I do in that case? Or not maybe narrate it. Sometimes there's a sharing setting that says include the audio. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, let me let me do that actually. Let me just reshare it quickly. Sharing, share sound. About 80% of the corn and cotton planted in North America is genetically Can you guys hear now? Yeah, we do. Thank you. Genetically engineered okay. to resist pest insects. These are commonly called BT crops and produce proteins that target very specific pests. The process of genetic engineering is faster and more precise than traditional breeding methods alone, allowing the modification or insertion of specific genes without altering any other traits. BT crops were created by using genes from Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, which is a common soil bacterium that produces proteins that are toxic to some species of pest insects. The genes that produce these proteins were inserted into the DNA of the crop. As a result, the BT crop produces these proteins and defends itself against specific pests. When a pest feeds on the BT plant, the protein binds to receptors in the insect's gut, causing the gut wall to break down and rupture, leading to the death of the insect. These proteins must bind to specific receptors in the pest's gut to work. Other organisms, such as humans, other mammals, beneficial insects, and spiders don't have those receptors and are unaffected. Although BT crops have helped manage pests for over 20 years, they are losing their effectiveness against some pests. Here are a couple of reasons why. First, while the goal of BT crops is to kill the target insects that feed on them, this is not... Actually, here I would like to interrupt and say that 
the reason that BT crops are losing its effectivity is not just because of plant variability or insect variability. It's also simply because of evolution. When you use one product over and over against everything else, you create a evolutionary pressure that makes you select for the ones that are not affected by it. This is something that is present in throughout the natural world in different cases. You guys have probably heard about uh, superbugs or antibiotic resistant bacteria or even with cancer when some drugs just stop working. It's the same principle. If you use the same treatment over and over again, the treatment will stop working. Um, not always so achieved due to natural variability of the levels of BT protein within a plant. This means that some tissues in a plant may not have lethal levels of the protein. Second, insect populations are also variable. By chance, some insects are naturally less susceptible to certain BT proteins. They will survive and reproduce while the majority of the population dies. This is how resistance develops. And resistance can always develop with any long-term pest management approach, including BT. So with that good note, let's look at what I actually do. So I specifically study VIP3A, which is the latest generation of naturally occurring BT protein. Um, this is the only BT protein right now capable of controlling fall army worm. The older proteins that was in use since 1990s to this point forward has basically stopped working. And you can see here, this is a field that is BT cotton versus this is non-BT refugia. And you can see the level of difference between the two. And even here, you have a corn that is BT cotton, uh, BT corn versus non-BT corn, you can see one is clearly more damaged than the other. Like if you had to choose, you would probably not eat the one on the left. So with all of this, we also have to understand that as the video said, resistance is inevitable. So what we do is we try to understand how the resistance may evolve. Because if we can understand how the resistance may evolve, we can actually screen for it. If we know that this is going to happen, we can reduce the use of it, let the natural population build back up, and then use it again so it doesn't become a catastrophic field failure. As a farmer, the one thing that you don't want is a field failure. Here you have a list of different insects that we have found resistance to VIP through field collection and um, laboratory selection. Almost all of these are lab selected, but these alleles do exist in field. I particularly work with these two strands here in the red. One is from Louisiana, the other is from Texas, and they are both monogenic autosomal recessive inheritance. What does that mean? It means that the resistance trait is not specific to one gender. So it is autosomal. It is monogenic. That means only one gene is mutated. We know that. We just don't know what gene. And it is recessive. It's usually better when it is recessive because that means the heterozygote, the hybrid strains, they will not show resistance, which means the resistance population at any given time will be relatively low. Now, the mechanism for resistance in fall armyworm has only two evidence. One, uh, actually both of them come from China. One is a mutation in chitin synthesis, and the other one is a mutation in a specific transcription factor that leads to a wide variety of changes. But the two strains that I work with when I started working on it, no one knew what the mechanism was. So to understand what can cause resistance, we first have to understand how the toxin works in the first place. So 
here you have the insect feeding on a plant that expresses the whip protein. Now, the whip protein is usually produced in an inactive form. The inactive form is called protoxin. The protoxin enters the insect body where it mixes into the blood, not blood, hemocell, and where it gets exposed to um, enzymes, insecticide, insect enzymes, specifically trypsin and chymotrypsin. These enzymes can cleave the protoxin and change its form. So initially, you have this shape, which then becomes a syringe-like shape. The syringe form is called the active toxin. The active toxin can then specifically bind to the receptor that is present in the midgut. Midgut is basically insect equivalent of small intestine for us. And how like we have microvilli in our small intestine, insect midguts also have these projections that are almost like microvilli in us. These areas have thousands of uh, cell surface proteins, some of which will be receptor for the toxin. As the toxin binds to this protein, it is then able to sort of like an injection insert into the cell. Once inserted into the cell, it causes pore in the cell membrane. So basically the cell becomes a porous mess. When that happens, you have osmotic shock and you have all the bacteria that is inside the cell come out. So you have a situation that is basically septicemia and the insect will die. Even in cases where the insect doesn't die, their growth is slowed, they may never mature or they not they may not lay eggs. So either way, the problem is solved for you. So here are the strains that I am working with. Um, this LASS and LARR are near isogenic equivalent. So these strains are identical except for the one gene that we are trying to find. Because the only thing they differ is that LARR is resistant to VIP3A while this one is not. Same thing for Texas susceptible and Texas resistant. These are also near isogenic. However, Texas RR and Louisiana RR are not equivalent to each other. In fact, if you cross them together, they will no longer be resistant. That is because the gene that is mutated in them is different. And we have a secondary susceptible strain called Benz or Benzon, which is a lab selected strain for over 15 years now and used throughout every lab that works with fall army worm because this is pretty much the ultimate susceptible strain. It is inbred to the point it doesn't have resistance against anything. So what are my objectives? The first objective is to understand what causes the resistance? What is the mechanism? So for that, I have to look at the gut pH, how the protoxin is processed, and whether the toxin binding is altered, which are the three main steps of the VIP3A mechanism. So I am looking at the steps of mechanism and looking at where the step is actually breaking down. And then once I have the idea of the mechanism, then I, I actually have to find out what gene is mutated. Because that's the end goal, right? As a farmer, you want to find out what gene do I have to look at to know if I can use this product or not. If I cannot find the gene or cannot really progress the work towards finding the gene, it doesn't really help. So first question, is resistance associated with reduced processing? Why do I want to see that? Because the first step in the VIP3A activity is the protoxin has to be converted to the active toxin. Unless it is converted to active toxin, it's not really going to work. So for that, I will look at proteolytic digestion. If I see a difference in processing, I will verify that with protease activity and bioassay. 
if there is no difference in processing, then processor is not responsible. But to verify whether there is processing at all, first we are going to look at the gut pH response. This side you have the susceptible strain. When the susceptible strain feeds on sugar solution, which is my control group, you can see that the midgut has a highly alkaline pH. That is normal. Unlike humans, insect midgut is highly alkaline. But look at what happens when it feeds on protoxin or active toxin. In either case, the gut pH becomes almost neutral. That is because the toxin is able to poke holes, the gut damage, the pore formation. Once the pore formation happens, the alkaline uh, gut content mixes with the hemocell. The hemocell is acidic. What happens when acid and alkaline mix? It becomes neutral. That's what we are seeing here. But on the flip side, when I am looking at the resistance strain, you can see that while toxin is able to make the gut pH neutral, the protoxin is not. The protoxin is behaving pretty much the same way the controls are behaving. What does that tell me? It tells me that my insect is first of all susceptible to active form and the protoxin is not being activated. Because once the insect feeds the toxin, the insect will automatically active the toxin. So if the protoxin is not doing anything, that means first of all the protoxin is not being activated. And secondly, the activated toxin is still toxic. So that's my first evidence. Now we back it up by looking at the processing. What do I do? I dissect the larvae to collect the midgut fluid. The midgut fluid is then mixed with buffer and the protoxin. Incubate it in 37 degrees Celsius to basically mimic the condition of the insect midgut. And then I sample it at certain times. Then I will run a HDS fed gel, which will separate the proteins on basis of their mass, and then stain the gel to see what is the activation pattern. Here, this is the input protoxin band. As you can see here, with the resistance strain, the protoxin band remains what it is. But in the susceptible strain, you can see over time, the activation band starts appearing. This means the protoxin is being activated as it is expected to in the susceptible strain, but is not activated in the resistance strain. Then I verify the same experiment with benzone strain, which is another susceptible. So I want to make sure that the lack of activation is consistent with other susceptible strains as well. And you can see here that we can see an activated toxin at 120 minute mark for the, actually even earlier than that. <laughs> Sorry. We can see an activated band from 60 minute for benzone, but there is no activated pattern even at 120 minute for the resistance strain. Then I want to make sure that this is only specific to VIP. So remember when I was telling you the older toxins that no longer work, the most famous one is Cry1F. So I test it with Cry1F and you can see here that both susceptible and resistant seem to be activating this toxin at the same rate. So whatever difference in activation that I am seeing, it is specific to the VIP3A. Now, if there is a difference in activation, that means there should be a difference in enzymatic activity. Because without enzymatic activity, there is no activation. So to further verify that there is truly a difference in activation, 
I am going to look at specific protease activity of trypsin and chymotrypsin enzymes. How would I do that? There are enzyme specific substrate that can be used. And when you mix them with the midgut fluid, that substrate will be cleaved based on the amount of enzyme you have. And you it will create a product based on whether fluorescence or absorbance that you can measure. So okay. this gives you a quantitative idea. And you can see here that for my susceptible strain, I have both more trypsin and more chymotrypsin compared to my resistant strain. Now, I want to finally verify this with bioassay. Why do I want to do this? It's not enough to see that something is not activating. We actually have to verify that it's also not killing. So this is what I'm doing here. The gut fluid is being mixed with the protoxin, incubated at 37 degrees Celsius, and then the mixture I am putting on artificial diet. And then feeding it to a resistant neonate. If the toxin is being activated and if it is toxic, the larvae will die. If it is not activated or if it is not toxic, the larvae will not die. So let's see what happened there. As you can see here that we see a much greater mortality when the Protoxin is treated with gut fluid from benzone. A much less mortality when it is mixed with the gut fluid from the resistant strain. Similarly, the body mass gain is much higher when it is treated with the gut fluid from LARR compared to when it is mixed with the gut fluid from benzone. This is expected because this is telling me that the the protoxin is not being activated in the LARR. However, there is still one problem. This mortality is still at 50%. It's not 100%. If my resistance was entirely dependent on processing, this mortality should be 100%, not 50. Which led me to the next step, which is the binding. So how do we actually quantify binding? We make something called brass border membrane vesicle. You take the midgut, you purify the proteins, and you form a vesicle in such that the proteins that were in the membrane are also sticking out of this vesicle. Then you put labeled toxin, which will bind to both low affinity binding site and high affinity binding site thus giving you a signal that is indicative of total binding. Then you add in the competitor, which is a lot and lot of non-labeled toxin. Why? The idea is because the non-labeled toxin is so much more abundant, all the high affinity binding sites, the location which would truly bind to the toxin, they would get filled by the non-labeled toxin, which means all the signal you will get you will get from low affinity or non-specific binding. So when you subtract these two, you get the specific binding. I did it in two different ways. First one is Western blot, which gives me a qualitative idea by looking at the band intensity. And we used biotin label toxin. And the second one is a quantitative method where I actually can put a value to the amount of binding. And that one was done with Alexa fluoride level toxin. And here are the results of the same. This is the quantitative method where I take the BVMV, I put increasing amount of toxin to it and see how much of the toxin is being bound. As you can see, the resistant strain binds much less toxin compared to the susceptible strains. But even though it is significantly less, the difference is not as drastic as we have seen in other cases. And you can see the same exact thing with the Western blot data. This is the susceptible total band, which is comparable to the input, which is just labeled toxin. 
I'm just trying to see how much signal would I get when it is 100%. Compare that to the resistance total, which is almost nothing. And when I use uh, image J to densitometrically measure how much is here, you can see it's like one sixth. Now, I have to try and identify what are the resistant genes. So for that method, we did RNA-seq. To do RNA-seq, we first extract the total mRNA out of uh, six individual larvae from each strain, then run it through this pipeline. This pipeline is not something that you really need to understand, but this is just the pipeline for RNA-seq. We get the differentially expressed gene through DE-seq2 and verify selected genes with qPCR. There are a lot more genes that are differentially expressed in DE-seq2. So you have to pick and choose which genes actually make sense to confirm with qPCR. And these are the selected genes that I checked with qPCR. Um, as you can see, all of these genes are significantly downregulated in the resistance strain compared to the susceptible. Among here, we have calmodulin, which is a calcium signaling molecule. It is a transcription factor used in so many different pathways. Then you have P53, regulator of apoptosis. You have chymotrypsin. You have trypsin. You have chitin synthase and you have ABCB proteins. So ABCB proteins are uh, membrane receptors. So maybe it has one of my receptors that I'm looking for. The trypsin and chymotrypsin further validates that processing is truly altered. Then I actually want to find out where exactly is the mutation located. And as you can see here, we get a very clear peak at chromosome 3. So whatever gene I am looking for that is causing my resistance is in that location. However, the problem here is that under that peak, there is not a single gene. There will be dozens. So that makes it slightly difficult to actually further confirm what is the one target that you are trying to find. But if you have a locus, you can at least screen for that locus. So what are the summary? We know that processing is involved. We know that toxin binding is also involved. We know the specific mutation that I am trying to find is located in chromosome 3. Now, let's move on to the Texas side. In Texas side, I repeat the same protocols to make sure whatever I get is actually consistent, right? So as you can see here in the gut pH, we don't see a change in pH for either of the toxins in resistance strain. So the susceptible behaves exactly as you'd expect for the susceptible. In fact, if you look at the susceptible between the two susceptible strains, they are pretty much identical. But the resistance strain control and both toxins overlapping each other. In fact, you cannot even see the toxin band. You can only see a tiny little bit of it. But both of them are still taking damage from Cry1F, which if you remember, my insect is not resistant to Cry1F. So this is further validation that my experimentation is correct. Then I want to validate that data with processing. And as you can see here, the protoxin band size does not really differ a whole lot between the strains. And specifically at 24 hour mark, both of them have exactly identical toxin band. And for both of them, the protoxin is, has completely disappeared. And of course, one is not enough. So I did four biological replicates. And I took the densitometric approach to show how they differ. As you can see, the error bars are consistently overlapping. 
which means that they are not going to be significantly different. But here comes the shocker for me. I still did the protease activity to see if there was a difference. And yes and behold, there is a difference. But it is the susceptible that has less activity. The resistance is actually processing, like it may be able to process it faster. And when I look at it, I can kind of see that. Because at 30 minute mark, I can see a toxin band forming. But then it kind of does really make a whole lot of difference. So even though we see a difference, that difference is not really validated in the processing data. So, of course, I will have to look at the binding assays next. And I do. And you can see here just like it was for the other strain, you can see a significantly higher binding signal for the susceptible compared to the resistant. And then I have to validate that with quantitative data, and I do. And you can see like these are almost going in parallel, that there is a consistent difference. And given how they are going in parallel, that actually makes me think that this is not so much that there is a reduced binding. It is more like there is a receptor protein that it flat out missing. So what I think is happening in this situation is the susceptible has two or three receptor protein that are all binding to VIP while the resistance has maybe one or two. There is something missing because if it was not about that, you would not expect to see a parallel increase. Now, I actually did a bioassay again to make sure that there was no difference. And you can see that uh, the mortality is extremely high for the susceptible at both types of toxin, which is expected because it's susceptible in the first place. But even though there is very low survival, or sorry, there is very low mortality, it's kind of interesting that the activated toxin is actually showing slightly less mortality compared to the protoxin. But at that level of difference, it is nothing. Like when we are comparing this to the two resistance strain, it's nothing. Um, I performed the RNA seq with this one as well to see whether we saw something similar. And not really, because remember, trypsin was down regulated in the other strain. Here, trypsin is actually up regulated in resistant, which again makes sense because of this. I know trypsin is more in the resistant strain. So it's good to see when multiple types of experimentation all validate each other. There are multiple uh, receptor proteins that are downregulated. So that gives me the confirmation that in this strain, it's binding that's the sole cause of resistance. My next step will then be to actually validate what resistant gene is involved. For that, I have... Um, extracted the DNA out of uh, total 200 insects from each strain. And all of these strains are going to then be sequenced and compared against each other to generate a plot like this. This will give me where the resistance locus is. And once I get the idea of the resistance locus, Unfortunately, I won't have any time to finish further work. What we could do is we could look at the genes that are in there and start knocking them down one by one. As we knock them down, if we hit our correct target gene, the resistance would completely just go away. So that is the main process. Um, 
I also want to make sure if the chitin content is different because another paper has shown that chitin content can cause resistance and I do have chitin synthesis gene being downregulated. So that is something I need to validate. And then I need to use linkage analysis to actually confirm whatever target genes that we have are truly like that in the susceptible versus resistant. So that is a method of where you collect a mixture of insects, both susceptible and resistant. You breed them, go into the F2. In the F2, if you remember uh, Mendelian genetics, Monogenic resistance means you will have one fourth of the resistant allele when you are crossing to F1. So, I if I do the assay and look for different genes, and for one gene, I find only one fourth of the samples are showing me the resistant allele. So, that is the one that I am trying to find. That is one other way without using knockdown to confirm which gene is likely to be the resistant gene and what we need to look at. Um, of course, I need to acknowledge the funding source, which is USD MIFA, my committee members, Dr. Juan Luis Urat Fuentes, Dr. Staten, Dr. Moore, Dr. Goodrich Player, my collaborators from Texas A&M and LSU. Um, and Dr. Master for giving me the chance to talk to you guys. This is my lab. A um, couple of people have already left, but this is the group that I worked with and without whom pretty much none of it would be possible. And with that, I would open it up for questions. Oh, well, I guess I can ask one. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, Dr. Engel. Hi, Rajiv. Can you hear me? Hello, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Jeff Engel here. Remember yeah. NP Labs? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I completely remember. <laughs> well, um, so I'm wondering between those two um, different mutations you're looking at, is there a difference? Yeah. Which one you think? I mean, I'm thinking one may be more specific than the other, might be a more general defense. And but at this, um, in terms of which that, but also if you think one of them just makes it harder for the critter to digest his food more than the other one. True. In fact, that is exactly where my current thought process is as well. The binding alteration or the receptor mutation is highly specific. Whereas the protease alteration, the digestion-based one, is more general. In fact, that, you are 100% correct, that would make it difficult for the insect itself. Hello. Because whatever it's going to consume, it needs to digest. Whereas the receptor one, it is specific to the toxin and only to the toxin. And that usually means that Whenever there is a receptor alteration, you get a much higher level of resistance compared to when it is anything else. So when I was showing the resistance ratio, we are saying greater than 632, greater than 395, but we don't know what the upper limit is. It is possible for the one where it is more specific that the upper limit is 10,000 fold, whereas the other one where it is less specific, it is maybe 700 fold. From a agriculture point, it doesn't matter to you. But from a molecular point, it definitely does matter. So it's just a matter of what someone wants to find. For example, here, the HZIA, this was also done by our lab. And when there is a reduced binding, you can see a fold change of 45,000. Whereas when it is a reduced protease activity, you only see a close to 300 fold difference.
Thank you for the question, though. Rajiv, how do you put a knockout into a wild population if you after you guys figure this all out? It seems that, that would be pretty crazy. Um, honestly, you cannot really do a knockout into the wild population. What you can do is you can collect wild insects from the lab. You uh, from the field, you can go to the next generation in the lab, and then knock it out there. And then redistribute it into the wild is the idea. Uh, not really. So the gene drive, which is what you're, you are referring to, because that is what you do when you redistribute a knocked out insect into the wild, will not work here. Those will only work when there is actually a sexual component to it. If I try to do it here, it will pretty much do nothing. But what we are going to do is once we know what gene is causing it, you can do a field sampling each year. In fact, USDA already does that. So what they do is they collect random insects from uh, plots all across the country, and then they screen it for different types of insecticide or resistance or uh, whether the resistant genes are located. That is where uh, we are coming in. Like once we identify what we need to look at, then USDA can use that to identify that. So once you know that that field population has high amount of resistance, you can actually avoid using the product there for a while until the resistance level goes down. Does that make sense? Uh, Dr. Meager? Yeah, so Rajiv, um, yeah. Can, you, uh, can you show the graph that you showed when, um, I think you were talking about identifying where the mutation is, uh, working yes. for Louisiana, but not for Texas yet. So uh, I'm not familiar with this. There are some genetic students here. Can you tell okay. us what's in this picture? What's the x-axis? What is the y-axis? What, what, is, what does this tell us? Okay, so this is a bulk segregant analysis. The idea here is you create two pools. One pool is made of susceptible individuals, and the other pool is made of resistance individual. You extract the DNA from both and compare them against each other. This y-axis is the frequency of the SNPs. The high amount of SNPs would tell you that this is the region that is most different between the two. Given that we are starting with near isogenic insects, we can assume that wherever the maximum amount of difference will be, that will be the location where the resistance locus lies. And in the x-axis, you can see uh, basically the length of the chromosome. So it's giving you an idea of where that location is. For example, this particular area that I am highlighting with an arrow, that is the end of chromosome three. Okay. Okay, so and, we, just, we have just talked about Manhattan plots. So it looks mm -hmm. sort of like that. You're comparing one group of, one phenotype to another phenotype, identifying right. where, there, where there are differences between the two types. Correct. And yes, I also prepared Manhattan plots for my analysis, but I like this one because it's a little bit cleaner than the Manhattan plot. Uh, Manhattan plot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You were talking about proteases, so they're wildly different in two different populations, right? Because it goes up in one yes. population, comes down. Mm -hmm. in and what's the main disadvantage of the proteases going up? Well, the disadvantages of protease going up is less than proteases going down. If the proteases are going up, then you are basically processing it faster. So the disadvantage that will come, not with this insect, but with other cases, is that if there is a toxin that requires activation, it will get activated faster. 
which means you are exposed to the poison faster. But from a nutritional standpoint, if the protease amount is higher, you may completely degrade some nutrient, which means you may not get the complete nutritional demand that your body has. But again, it is much less than if the enzymatic activity was lower. Because that would mean even if you are eating, you are not getting as much nutrient you need from that food. That is kind of sir, where our work uh, intersects with this because we had worked with protease inhibitors before in your lab. Yeah. So, but does the virus, or not the virus, does the um, endotoxin actually stimulate proteases or was that just incidental based on the species, you know, the, the variety or whatever, the susceptible? versus the resistant, was that just due to their physiology or due to something induction? Um, no, this is physiological because this was before the induction. I actually did not test with induction because um, even though we can assume that feeding on the toxin will induce protease activity, we never really tested that. Because to make sure that the insect is actually feeding on the toxin, you need to use a dye. And that dye makes it hard to actually get the signal for your enzyme activity. Anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you so much, Rajiv. Yep. And thanks for being a proud alumni for WIU. And, uh, we, we're going to bestow the fact that you are basically a professor for the day for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. Um, I'm just going to stop the recording now. Thank you. Thanks for coming or visiting with us. We hope yep. to see you in person sometime. Yes. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.